Welcome, welcome everyone. Great to see you all. Thank you so much for choosing to worship with us this evening. Those of you who are online, those of you who are in the house, I just want to thank you so much uh, for coming to worship God tonight and also to uh, study God's Word. And so before we go to Him and uh, to, to His Word and for Him to really instill these things in our hearts, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just pray that you would prepare our hearts, prepare our minds, prepare each and every one of us, Lord. You say that every time that we open your word, that you have a very specific message for each one of us, and that through faith we can carry out that message. So, Lord, I just pray that you would be in, instilling your word in our heart, and as we listen to the message that you have for us tonight, that we would be thinking about those areas in our life to where you want to mold us, where you want to change us, where you want to, to be out with the old and in with the new and be transformed by this new renewing of our minds and our, and our hearts, Lord. And so I just pray for each one of us. And I know that each one of us can take that step of faith today and on into this week as we, as we humbly proclaim your word. So, Lord, we come to you in awe of your grace and awe of your mercy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, as we get started, we want, we want to talk a little bit about last week. Last week we were going through, I'll uh, just do a quick recap if you weren't here last week. We're in 1 Thessalonians. We started off with chapter 1. And in chapter 1, Paul is, is speaking to the Thessalonians in a really good light, saying, I'm amazed on how you went through all of this trial, this struggle, this tribulation, the struggles that they went through of being persecuted, and they were able to turn their, their eyes towards Jesus, turn their eyes towards the Lord, and continue to follow Him, even though they didn't have very much influence from a uh, teacher perspective there. So it's amazing, and he just, he starts off with his first section there in prayer, in, in a thanksgiving prayer, and we, and we prayed for all of us, and so if you, uh, we prayed for all of God's church, and all of, all of Grace Community Church, and all of us who are believers, we wanted to, to give thanks in following through with, with God's love, even in persecution, and so if you didn't have a chance to watch that, go back and listen, but went from this thankful prayer of faith, hope, and love, right? That, that whole concept brought out not only in 2 Corinthians, but also 1 Thessalonians. And then, then we talked about who we are in Jesus. And it's a very important part to know who we are in Jesus and where we are now on our faith journey and on our faith walk. So he gives us the preface of who we are, and we went through all the different seven components of who we are in Jesus, so that as we know who we are, we know where Jesus fits in our life, we know that we have set aside the sinful heart, the sinful nature, and we have adopted and brought in the, the loving, kind heart from the Spirit. The Spirit is what drives that. And so we might find ourselves one of three places tonight. In one place, we might be the, the new believer that's really excited if we can turn that down just a little bit, I'm getting a little echo there. I don't know if you guys are, but um, so, it, you know, you might find yourself as one of those folks where you are a new believer, you're excited, you just accepted the Lord into your heart, and now you're wondering, okay, what is this life, what is this Christian life all about? And so what he's going to be talking about is how to be God's love if you're in that situation. Well, what if you're another per type of person in your walk? Maybe you're, maybe you're the, the person who says, yes, I've, I accepted the Lord early on in my life or before, years ago, and, and now I've been following Him. But I'm, the way I'm following Jesus is a way that is, I'm still trying to figure out the hardships in my life and where God is, is, is helping me, is where He's providing and, and where He's been very truthful and kindful. Or not truthful, but His, his truth and word his, lives throughout my life, and I can see it. Maybe you're one of those folks who, who can see God working in and through your life. And so he's encouraging those folks, those of us who are there, to also say, how can we be God's love to those around us and to 
to everyone who, who comes in contact with us. But what about the third folks that are here too, those of us who, who are in a situation where not only have we given our lives to the Lord and not only have we seen God work throughout our lives and we're trusting Him day to day, now we're at a place where we know for sure that all of our needs are fully taken care of and we know that God will be there in every instance, every circumstance. Every trouble, every trial, every challenge, and every success that God brings those into our lives. And when we know that, and all of that's taken care of, now I have a deep-rooted heart to care for how many people come to know Him. I, I come to a, a place in my faith journey and my walk that says, I want those, I have this deep desire of those around me to know Him. So wherever we are on this faith journey, each one of us, Paul is encouraging us here in 1 Thessalonians 2. He's, he's saying from the get-go, no matter where you are on your journey, I'm going to encourage you in four ways to literally be God's love. That's what he's encouraging us to do. And if we are going to be encouraged to do this, we're going to face a few main things. We will be in certain circumstances. We will be certain in a certain way. We want to see that throughout uh, the scriptures here. So if, if you brought your Bibles tonight, let's go ahead and open up to 1 Thessalonians 2. And we're going to start off with uh, two, verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 1. And he says here, You know, brothers and sisters, that our visit to you was not without results. So he's really starting off by saying, remember, he was praying before. He said, thank you for everything. Here's where we are in Jesus. Now, when I was with you, there were results. What were those results? Those results were Paul, and they were there. They were sharing the gospel. They were sharing that Jesus had died for our sins, and, and people came to know him. They came to know the Lord, they came to rely on the Lord, and they were walking with the Lord at that point. And they still were walking with the Lord even after being heavily persecuted. And this is after Paul and Silas had to flee uh, the town because they were, they were uh, almost uh, put to death at that point. They were, they were running for their lives. And so he's thanking them, remember, and he's saying now in, in chapter 2, verse 1, he says, there were results. But what were the results? The results were people were denying themselves, they were picking up their cross daily, and they were following him, no matter where they were, whether they were new believers, maybe they had just came to know the Lord later on after Paul and Silas left. Someone was also teaching the good word, and, and they were growing by numbers still. And it was interesting to hear that he says the results but the results are not something that we conjure up, is it? It's not something that we're looking for. It's something that God does. You know, our job is to plant seeds and water them. It's God's job to grow the people up into knowing Him. So when we're talking about seeds, the seeds concept will come back. You know, the, the sower of the seeds concept comes up many times. And the concept is, is that we are simply just the sower of seeds. We're just simply to share God's good word. We're there to water the best we can, and it's up to God for God to grow them. And we'll talk about the two different types of seeds here in a minute, not from the sower of the seeds example, but just in here, there are two different types of seeds being planted, the good seeds and the evil seeds. And we'll see that later on in some of the scripture. But the idea is the results. The results is, again, if we're going to plant good seeds, then we should have good results, good outcomes. If we're going to plant evil seeds, we're going to have evil outcomes, right? And, the, and here's what it really talks about is who's planting the seeds. Those are the disciples. So in John 8, 31 through 32, it says, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciple. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Remember what he's saying here. He's saying, if you hold to my teaching. Well, this is what the Thessalonians were doing. They were holding to God's teaching. They knew the truth. They knew the truth could set them free. They were at a place where they were wanting to expand that to everybody in their communities. They were reaching out day after day, even through persecution. They were trying to get by and, and sometimes having to do it in secret. 
because they would have been persecuted and stoned or de- and put to death. And so here we are saying that, again, to be God's disciple, we have to hold to his truths. And when we're his disciple, when we're his disciple, we go through John 15, 8 here. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit. When we're the disciples, as we go out to disciple to many nations, right, to preach the gospel to many nations, when we are learning and we're sharing God's word to all of those, we will produce much fruit. Now, this is the fruit of the Spirit, and this is also fruit, meaning that we're going to help others come to know God. And what are the fruit of the spirits, right? It's the love, joy, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. That Those are the aspects. But remember, those aspects can't be done by us alone. Can't be done by my will. Every part of what I would be doing if it was a selfish part would be rooted in something that would, would be that I would want. So all of the fruit of the Spirit comes from the Spirit who's within us. And that's Jesus who indwells us, right? He, he gives us the Spirit. When Jesus left and rose, he gave us the Spirit so we could commune, talk with God, and have God with us every day. And so with that, Jesus tells us in Matthew 28, 19, he says, Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit. Go then... Right? So that's our job. As we, as we are going on our faith journey, our job is to then go out, be the disciples God has asked us to be, share the good news, and the results are up to God, but we will see them. We will see them in the lives, in the people around us. We will see them in our lives. Remember the, the faith journey, the few different folks that we have in the house tonight or online, is that we are somewhere in that faith journey. And, and where we are is, is, again, being encouraged by Paul to share that good news, share how God has restored our life, share how God has brought us through suffering so that other people can, can know God's love, true love as well. And in Mark 16, 15, Jesus says to them, go into all the world and pl- proclaim the gospel to, the, to all the whole creation, right? Proclaim the gospel, proclaim my good word, is what he's saying. And so, that's, this is the preface of to be God's love, we then need to share God's love. If, if Jesus resides within us, if you will, the Spirit resides within us, and we're following God's word, then we can be God's love to those around us, okay? And so when we're doing that, these are the four elements how we will know we're doing that. The first one is that we will be persecuted. We will be persecuted. So a lot of folks ask the question, am I following Jesus? Do I know God? Am I listening to God? Can I hear him? Well, one of the first things you know you can hear him first and foremost is to know that he's with you in persecution. And that's exactly what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 2.2. 2. He says, We had previously suffered and been treated outrageously in Philippi, as you know, but with the help of our God. You want to underline that? Help of our God. We dared to tell you his gospel in the face of strong opposition. So right there, they knew God was with them, and no matter what the consequence would be, no matter what the suffering, the struggle, whatever that was, they were willing to share God's good news, in, despite what was going to happen to them. But it was with God's help. God was there. They knew it. They felt his presence. Remember, Jesus always says, my sheep hear my voice. So if you're ever questioning where you are on your faith journey, All you have to do is ask. All you have to do is commune with God. Say, Lord, where are you? You're here. Now guide me. And if you're putting aside the selfish nature of the world and your heart and your own selfish heart, and you're saying, okay, Lord, I'm ready to follow you, then at that point, you're going to be hearing and he's going to be guiding. And and as long as you're communing and, and discussing with him and having a relationship that's in your prayer lives, Right? We've talked about this before in, in James where he was talking about prayer, but prayer isn't just, it's just not an activity you checkmark on your daily list. It's, a, it's communication. You, you don't get to know your family 
by just checking a box to say, yep, I said hi this morning. You, you don't get to know your loved ones by just checking a box saying, I did that good thing for them. You get to know them by being with them, living life with them, experiencing the goods and the bads. And, and where is Jesus in this relationship with you? Is this just a one-sided relationship where he loves you so much and you're not going through life talking with him, communing with him, talking with saying, Lord, here's where I am at today. Here's what's going on throughout the day. That he knows what's happening. He just wants to hear it from you. It's, it's just like us with our kids, right? We want to know what happened throughout their day, but we know what happened. They played. They bumped their noodle a couple times. They skinned their knee. They played some more. They went to the bathroom a few times and they ate a bunch of food. We already know that, but we want to hear from them, don't we? And it, it's the funny stories. And this is obviously, I'm talking about my little kids, right, as they grow up. But even to some degree, our older kids, we do the same thing, don't we? We know what happened. They went to work. They went home. They ate. They went potty. They took a shower. They, you know those things. But we still want to hear from them. No matter how small or how big, we want to hear from them. And that's how we are going through this relationship with Jesus. That's how we're walking this relationship. We're walking it because in the face of those persecuted times, we're already in relationship. We don't have to start one. Oh, Jesus, now this whole world is falling apart around me. Now I'm going to pray. Now I'm going to finally talk to you, Lord. Right? We, we don't have to be there. We should already be in a place where we've been talking with the Lord, being with him in the exciting times and in the struggling times. And so now when big persecution hits, we say, oh, Lord, wow, I am curious. I'm excited. I'm joyful to see how you're going to bring me through this. This is the persecution that Paul talks about. We're going to be persecuted but we're going to have joy in the Lord knowing that he's there and that he's already got it worked out. We might need to suffer. We might pray for the suffering to leave, and he might, he might take the suffering, but he might not. Right? We talked about that in the previous time is what are we praying for? Are we praying for God's will to be done, or are we praying for our own will to be done? So when it comes to praying and proclaiming God's good glory, Paul encourages us to do that at all times. In the goods, in the bads, in the smalls, in the large, all of the different areas of life. Not in your notes, but up here it says, in fact, this is Paul talking to Timothy. He says, in fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life, everyone who wants to go down this faith journey, everyone will be persecuted. Not, not just me, not just you, everyone. So we know we're going to face the persecution. And persecution means this. I'm standing up for God. So this is, this is an example in my life. When I got to share with my mom, she was asking me questions. Why is your life so different? Now, if you guys have come to know me, and some of you know me pretty well at this point, you know our lives are a bit different anyway because I'm a doctor and I live a, a healthy life and I tr do my best and my, my eating habits are way different than most and I do different things. And so my mom's talking with my wife and I at this time, and finally she's asking these questions. Why are you so different? Well, this is where we're at. This is what's going on. And then it dives in from the superficial. Why do you guys eat different? Why do you guys, why do, you guys do different things? Why are you trying to, to purposefully grow your marriage differently than the world? Why are you trying to then prepare for kids, even though you don't have kids, prepare your hearts in a way that is different? Why are you doing this? And then it transformed into this whole conversation about why are you different? How come you're different than the son I knew years ago? And so I got to share with her how God infiltrated my life and came into my heart and changed everything. Took me from the wretch, poor wretch that I was chasing the world to seeing light, to seeing the whole world in a different light, seeing it through the eyes of Jesus. And it was amazing. But here's what we're talking about with persecution. It's not just the struggles of not being able to pay a bill or not being able to to pay your uh, rent or, or not having a, uh, a meal to sit down to, it can be as intense as after that conversation that I had with my mom, my, my wife and I were driving back from, from Kansas City to Denver, 
And it was amazing to see that my wife and I felt really fulfilled. We felt finally like someone was listening to our story and, and that, wow, God was going to really move in the hearts of my mom and my stepdad, only to be faced with two weeks later finding a, a very long 10-page handwritten letter that I was basically dirt and that I had left the family all at a persecuted cost that says that if I'm going to stand up and say, I faithfully proclaim Jesus in my life and my life is transformed and I want you to know it, that I lost the relationship with my mom, that I lost the relationship with my stepdad for over 15 years. We had kids, multiple kids, three, four kids. My mom never even got to know them. It could be persecution like that. So it's not just the heaviness of things that we can be persecuted for. We could be persecuted primarily because we know Jesus, because we choose a different lifestyle. And I'm here to share with you that it's so much better to choose that. It is so much better. It's so much better because we know that at the end of the day, God has given me everything. Without him, I have nothing. So why would I, in the face of persecution, why would I then bow down to this world and apologize for living the way I do, for loving God the way we do? Why would I apologize? I don't need to. And neither do you. You don't have to apologize when, when you, you, you decide to buy the groceries for the person in front of you at the grocery store because they're, they're searching and they can't find the exact change and you decide to pay for that for them. And they say, oh, thank you. And then somebody else says, well, but they had the money. Like, why did you buy that? You, you don't have to apologize. You want to stand up and say, well, God showed me that I should do that. It was right on my heart. God was right there saying, you have the means. They may not hear so follow what God's sharing with you all the way because, again, he says everyone will be persecuted, whether it's in little things or in really big things. We will all face persecution. In 2 Corinthians 12, 10, he says, that's why for Christ's sake I delight in weakness. We're going to be persecuted, so I delight in weakness, in, in insults, in hardship, in persecution, remember what James said in chapter 1. He says, consider it pure joy, my brothers, to face trials of many kinds. He didn't say, joy, happy joy, I'm going to go out and, and just smile at everything bad. He says it's a contentment joy. This is what Paul is saying right here. He's saying, I delight. It's not a happy delighting. It's okay. I delight because God is here with me. I delight because in my weakness, God's strength is shown. Without me being weak in these areas, no one would see the Lord, right? And so he's saying, look, I'm going to delight in weakness, insults, hardships, persecution, difficulties. And again, for when I am weak, God is strong, right? God shows his strength through my weakness. And that's so important. Jesus also says in Matthew 5, 10, he says, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. Now remember, persecution isn't just because of our consequences. If we made bad choices and we have a consequence in front of us, that's a, that's a consequence or a discipline that's going on, right? That's just worldly discipline, things that will happen. That's not what he's saying here. He's saying, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. You're, you're persecuted for the very nature of having Jesus in your heart. When you say, Lord, come into my life, and change me, search me, O oh Lord, change me, change my selfish ways into the loving, righteous ways that you have for me. When we do that, when we do that, we are blessed in that sharing, and if we're persecuted, we're blessed in that. And again, it's not technically us, is it? Because we all, I don't know about you guys, I want to run from those confrontations. I want to run from conflict. That just... By very nature, it doesn't sound fun. It doesn't sound fun to walk head, head, head strong right into a hurricane. Right? And, and I know that each one of us has been or is facing right now hurricanes in your life. Some of us are in the calm of the storm. Right? Right before the second wave hits. 
So if we're persecuted, that is a way that we know that God is moving and working in our lives. We know if there's persecution going on, we can say, okay, Lord, I know you've got this. It's going to be tough, but I can rest assured and I can have delight that you're there with me, Lord. I'm delighting in you because I know you'll carry me through it. Uh, not in your notes, but up here it says, Jesus says, but I tell you, love your enemy and pray for those who will persecute you. There was not a day go by since my mom, since I left my mom's house, prayed for her every day. Started calling her every day. She didn't pick up my calls, but I called every day for a very long time frame. Then I kind of spread it out, but I didn't stop praying for her. Now, granted, she's my mom, and I love my mom dearly. And yes, there might have been some misunderstandings because she doesn't know what Christ's life was like back then. She didn't know. Well, I don't know all of the situations that were going on in our life, but right here it says this, love those who persecute you. Love those, not just because she's my mom, but because God loves her. God loves those who persecute you. God loves those who, who spit on your shoes or spit in your face or knock you down or tear you down or make fun of you. I mean, that's most commonly the case now. I see it in the workplace all the time. Coarse joking, knocking each other down just to lift someone up. If I want to lift myself up, I'm going to tear somebody else down with my words. And I'll make fun of them just because they know God. And I'll make fun of them because they're following Jesus. And I'll lift myself up because who needs Jesus anyway? Those are the people we need to pray for. Because Jesus loves them like he loves us. They just don't know him. They can't hear his voice. They can't read the Bible and know what he means by what he says in here. Because when they pick up the Bible, it's gibberish. He says that their eyes are blinded, their ears, they can't hear. But those who know me can read and understand. So to be in God's love, we will be persecuted. Number two, we will also be questioned. And what will we be questioned? We'll be questioned by our motives. Our motives will absolutely be questioned. Paul says here, he says, for the, for the appeal we make does not spring from error and pure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. Now, he's trying to clarify, because this is a process by which a lot of people were coming through Thessalonica, and they were coming through and traveling through, and they were trying to teach at the synagogues as well. They were teaching against what God was really standing for. They were teaching other things. And they were trying to trick people into following them as people, not following them because they're following God. They were trying to follow, they were trying to trick people to follow them as people because they wanted to get paid, they wanted to get money, they, they wanted to get help, whatever the selfishness was at the time that they were trying to get out of it. So he says, we're not trying to do that. Right? Paul was also, uh, he was trying to express that his motives were pure. And this is what we really need to understand. We will be questioned for our motives, for what we do. Whether, we, whether we're on a path with some friends and we, we take a different path and we start following God's guidance for our lives instead of following our friends, they're going to question our motives. Why are you going that way? And we need to stand firm in that, don't we? We need to stand firm in the truth because if we do not share the truth, we, we can mislead people. They're going to be asking. We're going to be sharing. And if we even remotely share a non-truth, it will guide them down the wrong path. And that's not what we want to do. We don't want to lead them down the wrong path. So we will be questioned by many based on our motives. Peter says here in, in 1 Peter 2, 1, he says, But there were also false prophets among you and among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. There will be false teachers in your life. I guarantee it. I've crossed quite a few in my life over the years, and I'm sure you've crossed some as well. There's going to be false teachers. Paul was saying that to, to the uh, Thessalonians. Peter's telling us as well. There's going to be false teachers among us. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies. 
I know that's a big word, but heresies really breaks down to just saying that it's falsities, it's false teachings. It's teaching against God's sovereignty, God's law, God's grace, the, the gospel, the good news that God came as the Messiah and he saved us from our sins. That is the, this, the, the, the heresy, if you will, that they are trying to speak against. They're speaking against the truth, the gospel, okay? And he says that they're denying the sovereignty of God, and that means that God is supreme. He's superior to everything else, everything even all in the universe, right? You've heard the story that if God created the heavens and the earth and everything in it, he has to be outside of it. He can't be inside the box that he created. That doesn't make sense. So what, what they were teaching against was to say that God was here and he was inside the box. How can you create the box if you're in the box? How can you create the box and everything in it if you're in it? It makes no sense. And so this is what he was trying to express to us is that God is sovereign above all. And so, again, we have to question those false teachers. And we also have to question ourselves and our motives. But people will do that as well. Right? As they start to listen to what God has shared with us in our lives, we will start to be questioned. In 2 Corinthians, Paul teaches us a very similar thing, but we're going to dive a little deeper on this false teacher's idea. For such people are false apostles, deceitful workers, masquerading. Now, let's think about masquerading. What does that mean? It's putting on a different face, a different, it's almost like in theater, right? You're putting on a different person in front of someone else. They're masquerading around as apostles. They were, mas they were putting on this, this facade that said, I am an apostle of Jesus. So listen to my words. But they're not. People will do that. People will, will talk about Jesus. There's a lot of movements right now that they're talking about Jesus, and it sounds good. But when you compare it to God's full word, it's not good at all. There's so many lies. And that's what he's saying here. And no wonder, he says, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. And I go back to the Garden of Eden. You guys remember the story of, 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 uh, of Eve right there in, in the garden. And we've got the serpent coming up. And, and remember that after God leaves their presence, he says, you know, you can eat of everything except this one. Because if you eat of it, you will surely die. And so here's the serpent now, this must have been okay at that time to be talking just openly, but she says to, you know, the serpent says to her, a seed of doubt. Remember when I said we're planting seeds of truth or seeds of evil? What was the seed of doubt? The seed of doubt that was planted was this. Now, God didn't surely say you would die. Like, if you eat the fruit, you won't die. And it was picking apart the part that was a seed of doubt. So she came to that temptation. How many temptations do we have like that? There's a seed of doubt. Go back a few months ago when we talked about in James, he says, don't be tossed like waves of the sea and doubt. When you ask of God, don't doubt. Know that God's there with you. This is what we're talking about. God does not have us doubt. God gives us certainty. If we're hearing his voice, we hear him, we know exactly what he says. There's no doubt. So this Satan himself masquerades like an angel of light, planting seeds of doubt, planting seeds of evil throughout our life. It's not a surprise then if his, certain, if his servants also mask around as service, servants of righteousness. So there's a bunch of people who say, follow me. I know this Jesus that you speak of, follow me. And then it turns out to be all about them. It's pretty easy to see some of those false teachers when it is all about them. Right? It's very easy to see. If it's not about Jesus, it's not about us coming to know Jesus and following him and walking with him, denying ourselves, picking up our cross every day, following him, having a great relationship with him every day, then we can see very quickly that it's a false teacher. So with that, in 1 Thessalonians 2.5, he says, you know that we never use flattery. 
We're never going to do that. Nor did we put on a mask to cover up the greed. We're not going to masquerade ourselves. We're not going to cover up the greed or selfish nature. We're not going to do that. And God is our witness. Because if we're following God, God is the witness, not only to us, but for us. If we're following his will and we're persecuted because people are blaming us, they're questioning us, they're doubting us, it's okay. Continue to share the good news. Continue to walk faithfully down that narrow path. And God is our witness in that situation. He will help restore those folks and help them and guide them back to him. So not only will we be questioned, but number three, we will also be approved by God. So to be God's love in our life so that we can be God's love around us, we will also be approved by God. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 2, 4, he says, On the contrary, we speak as those approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We are not trying to please people, but God, who tests our hearts. You want to circle tests. So how are we approved by God? Well, God tests us, right? Not in your notes, but up here it says in Psalms 26, 2, he says, Examine me, O Lord. This is the psalmist crying out to the Lord. He says, Try me, test my mind and my heart. Further on, Psalmist, Psalm 139, he says, Search me, O Lord, search my heart, try me, and know my anxious thoughts. Know me, Lord, test me, try me, try my thoughts, try my, my actions, try my words. Lord, test me, right? Know me. And then in Jeremiah 17, 10, this is amazing. This is where God responds to us in saying, I, the Lord, will search your heart, test your mind, even to give each man according to his ways and according to the results of his deeds. And here we go back to this idea that God is watching. He is creating the good work for us to do. We're following him, and he's producing those results. Right? And as we know, the Old Testament, just like in Jeremiah here, always teaches us about Jesus' coming and always basically Jesus is fulfilling all of those old laws. And here's God telling us the same thing that we're hearing God also tell us through the apostles and the prophets. In 2 Timothy 2.15, he says, do your best. So this is Paul talking to Timothy, one of his dear companions. And he says, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved. How are we approved? By God testing our, our thoughts, our minds, and our actions and making sure we're walking in God's will for our lives and walking with God and following him. And he says here, do your best to present yourself as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of God. Rightly handling. That means we don't see someone who may be going down the wrong path and just pick up the Bible and start reading verses and saying, well, God says this. Well, God says this. Don't you, you're supposed to do this. God says this. We want to come alongside them gently. If this is a brother in Christ who knows God, we don't just shove Bible verses down their throat, right? We actually come alongside them. And he's saying, rightly handling the word of truth. Rightly handling this. This is the precious word of God. And it's a living and active word that's not just living inside me coming out in, in my actions. It's there for me to share with you so you can come alongside, read and understand, and then implement this in your life. In 1 Thessalonians 2, 6, Paul says, we are not looking for praise from people, not from you or anyone else. Even though as apostles of Christ, we could have asserted our authority, but we're not looking for approval from men. We're not looking for approval from people. And this is very important. We will be approved, but we'll be approved by God if we're following God. You see the difference? We're not approved by men, and we're not looking for men's approval. I'm not looking for the approval of my mom to accept me. I'm looking at Jesus to accept me and say, Lord, accept me as I am, as a sinner, and change my life. And as my life changes, I want to share that. I want to share that with my family, my friends, all of you. And endearingly so, I hope you're able to share that with your friends and family and people you come in contact with every day. So not only will we, will we be approved by God, but we will also be gentle. 
We will be gentle in spirit. We will be gentle by God's grace. I love this. 1 Thessalonians 2, 7 through 8, Paul says, but we were gentle among you. And I love this analogy. Listen to his, his words here. He says, just as a nursing mother cares for her children, so we care for you. Because we loved you so much, we were delighted to not only share with you the gospel of God, but also we shared our lives with you. And this is what we do as Christians. This is the Christian walk. This is the narrow path, is that not only people who persecute us, people who are going down the wrong path, we're loving on them. We're sharing lives with them. We may not like it if it's our selfish nature, but God inside of us says we still love them. We want them to know a better light. We want them to know a better path. We will be gentle to them, just like an, a nursing mother cares for her children. What a beautiful picture of how God takes care of each one of us. In Colossians 4, 5 through 6, it says, Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. So again, people who don't know the Lord, be wise in our actions. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. So this means there might be some preparatory time. Preparatory time in prayer with the Lord and saying, Lord, I've got a tough conversation with a colleague today who doesn't like me. Lord, I love them like you do. Share with me as I'm reading your, as I pick up your word today and read your word. Can you guide me? Show me. Instill in my heart the words to say. Be there to be those words for me. Be gentle and kind. I know I'm going to get a lash back. I'm sure that he's going to get mad at me, but Lord, be there with me. Be gentle. I love this in Philemon 1.6. It says, I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. Becoming effective. Remember the results? We're praying that, that by sharing God's good good work in your life by sharing your story, that those stories will be effective to those around you, that they will know God, that they will see God's grace in and through your life so that they will seek him too. It's the results Paul is talking about to the Thessalonians. It's the results I'm talking with to us tonight, right? It's the results. How do we see that? We see it in the people around us. We see it in our own lives. It's very apparent. It's very apparent if, we're, if we've got God's eyes open, right? Our eyes are open toward the Lord, and God is showing us how God's moving and working in our life. And if, we're, if we've got that relationship with him, we can see where he's working and we can move accordingly. So, again, to summarize, we will be persecuted. We absolutely will be questioned for our motives. Who are we? And are we true? And sometimes it takes people over and over seeing our actions are truthful and our motive is right over and over and over. I have a, I have a staff member that over and over she was watching all the times that our office was persecuted for different things and watching how I was responding, watching how I was reacting and always testing just to see, questioning, is Shan going to do the right thing? Is Shan going to do this? What, what is he going to do this time? And in her mind, it was always, okay, I'm waiting. I'm waiting to see when it's the wrong thing. How many people don't know the Lord who are just watching you, waiting for you to do the wrong thing, and then say, wow, hypocrite you are. You follow God, but here you are. You messed up. Here you are. I can't follow somebody like that. That's crazy. I can't follow a God who, who, who you claim to follow because we're hypocritical. So he in all throughout here, our job is to just be cautious. Is it, we're we're going to make mistakes, and that's okay. God's there with us. He can, he can right those wrongs, right those mistakes. Sometimes we have to right them. We've got to ask for forgiveness. We've got to go to the person and let them know, look, that was my selfish nature. That had nothing to do with God. That was all my doing, and it was horrible. But because I have God in my heart, I can come ask for forgiveness, and I can make it right, and I can change that. And so that person who watches you and questions can then start to say, wow, not only did they, 
do they follow the Lord, but when they make mistakes, they make it right. So that's my encouragement this week to all of us, is to look at our lives in those four elements of, do we have those elements in our life? If we have those elements in our life, we are walking down this faith journey. And as we're walking down this faith journey, I'm going to encourage each one of us to deepen our faith. We're going to deepen our faith to communication with the Lord and being right there with him throughout the day, throughout all of our day. To listen to what he has for us, to make sure that if we are in trials or we are being questioned or we, we are talking with someone and we need that gentle spirit, that we're allowing God to speak, that we're not just jumping out there, sometimes like Peter in his anxiousness, you know jumping out there. Sometimes we do, but we should follow that up with what God has to say, not what we're saying. So that's my encouragement for us tonight. So let us close in prayer. Dear Lord, this is a long journey that you've got us on. Some of us are in the beginning of our journey. Some of us are at the end of our journey. Lord, this whole journey of knowing you, knowing that you love us so much, knowing that you've died for us, knowing that that we've accepted you into our lives and we said, Lord, we, there's nothing better. There's nothing else. I am nothing without you. Going from that part of our journey all the way into the journey that says, I am now trying to right all the things that are wrong in my life, Lord. Change, search my heart, O oh Lord, and change me. And then from changing me, now how do I share how I've been changed to others and how do I care about others' hearts and others' lives coming towards you? So we're going to examine ourselves in a moment here, Lord. And I just pray that we take that time to fully examine our hearts. Lord, you examine our hearts and share with us where we need to right those wrongs. Share with us where we can do good for you, Lord, and not grow weary because of your strength. That we can go through these seasons of trials and tribulations and suffering and persecution. That we can go through there learning and growing and coming to know you more and more. Just like parents to their children learn to know them more and more as life unfolds. So Lord, I pray for each one of us that you've touched our heart tonight, that through our faith that we can carry that out tomorrow, that we can walk the path that you have for us, walk this narrow path that leads to life. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.